cry out to you, have your way in us, your church. All this we ask in your name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, hey, welcome to French Church. My name is Seth. I'm one of the pastors on staff. And just excited that we get to be together today again. If this is your first time, uh, we encourage you to fill out that card and, and drop it off either at the white offering boxes or out at Guest Central. They have a, a, a gift for you. We'd love to get connected with you, as Pastor Chad already mentioned. We, we want to build relationship and help you get connected here at French Church. Everybody have a good Thanksgiving? Yeah? Come on. All right. Good, good, good. It always, it always amazes me how much work goes into a 12-minute meal. Just so much work, and it's over like that. We were able to be with uh, my in-laws, my, my wife's family in, in Canton, and just got to spend a good amount of time with them. Uh, my my father-in-law is, is notorious for any time that we, we have these major meals to, to surround it in um, a spiritual moment to have, have scripture and reflection, which, is, which I always appreciate. And this, this time, Psalm 136 uh, we did. It says, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. It's a little bit of a call and response. So, so go with me here. If I say, give thanks to the Lord for he is good, you say, his love endures forever. Come on, we can do better than that. You guys have had time to rest. Let's, let's do this again. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. We can keep going with that. Give thanks to the Lord for he, he hears my cry. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord because he sees me. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord because he saves. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord because he is in control. His love endures forever. We could keep going on and on with that whole service. The Lord is worthy of praise. The Lord is worthy of thanksgiving. And, and moments like this of celebrating thanksgiving give us a little idea of, hey, if we, if we are intentional with our time, in moments, we can create space that will just ignite gratitude in us, right? It, it'll, it'll help us to, to be more gracious and, and to, to see what the Lord has done. So I, I encourage you over the weeks leading up to Christmas, in these days, in your life, in your family, what are ways that you can create intentional moments that reorient your life and your mind to see what the Lord has done for you? Um, and those moments of doing that, of intentionality, breed gratitude, and they help us get out of maybe a season of cold indifference to, to God because of the busyness and, and all the things that we have to do and awaken us to the reality of what God wants to do in our lives as he's breaking in on us and, and arriving in our hearts in, in this season. Uh, let's make him a present reality. So I encourage you with that. Um, we're going to start and jump into a new series today, Sugar and Spice. Um, we're excited about this over the next five weeks. We've been looking forward to this series for a while because uh, about a year ago, uh, if you didn't know this, Willoughby Hills French Church is part of a larger group of French churches called the Evangelical French Church Eastern Region. It's a movement of other French churches, about 95, Michigan to Florida, Eastern Region um, is, is what we're part of. And, and one of the things that we're unified by is a unifying document, which is our faith and practice. It outlines our beliefs and, and distinctives of how we believe our beliefs should be lived out. If you were in a membership class recently, you would have heard more about that. If you're interested in learning more about us as a church and our history, you know, you've seen the sweatshirts, 1885, you know, our history goes back way, way beyond that through the Quaker movement. And there's a lot of great information to see behind the scenes of it. Encourage you to take time to be a part of the membership class. Anyways, all that to say, uh, the denomination has been in a, uh, a period of rewriting that the document, the faith and practice, getting some modern language, some, uh, some additional clarifying language, especially in the time that we're in the, of our world. We needed that. And so it's been a really great process. And what they did is they took that distinctives portion of how we live out our faith, how we unify things we believe we should live out as we believe these things. You tracking with me? They took that and they built it around this acronym as they laid it out of SPICE. So simplicity, it's we're to be a people with undivided hearts. Peace, we are a people called to be peacemakers. Integrity, we are a people who speak honestly. Community, we seek to function in harmony and not divisiveness. Equality, we live out, uh, we live as examples of compassion, service, and mercy to others. So anyways, it's been a year of doing this. It's been a great process, but Pastor Kyle heard that, and he goes, hey, you know what, I think I really can see how the story of Christ's birth, the Christmas story, fits into this outline. 
So over the next five weeks, we're going to be looking at how was the Christmas story of Christ's birth about simplicity, peace. We're going to say intentionality, community, and equality. So we're excited. We hope you join us for these weeks as we journey towards Christmas. It's going to be a great celebration. A lot's going to be going on, so you don't want to miss a week. If you do, you can always watch again online to catch up. But we hope you'll join us for this. Today we're kicking off week one by looking at simplicity, at the simplicity of the Christmas story. So how was the birth of Jesus simple? And if we're being honest, nothing about the birth of Jesus was simple. How, what was simple about a virgin conceiving by a child by the Holy Spirit? What was simple about uh, giving birth in an unfit environment? What was simple about the baby who was born being the Son of God, God incarnate, becoming flesh Nothing was simple about the circumstance of Christ's coming. But the purpose and the meaning of Jesus' birth was simple. Because we can define simplicity as uh, easy, right? Or plain, basic, straightforward, without uh, decoration or ornamentation. So yes, the story of Christmas was not simple in circumstance, meaning it wasn't easy, even to comprehend, but it was simple, straightforward in meaning and purpose. Are you with me, church? And here's the purpose. The purpose was this, that Jesus was God's solution to the world's problem. Jesus was God's solution to the world's problem. The the meaning was straightforward. That's why he came. And you're like, well, which one? Which problem? Name your headline, name your week, name your day. There's, there's problems around us. War, poverty, injustice, famine, whatever it might be, the tragedy, things in our control, things out of our control. Ohio State lost. Those are, these are problems. A little insignificant compared to world hunger, but you get the idea. There's problems all around us, and Jesus was God's solution to the world's problem, and the basic root problem with our world is sin. Man's bent towards self instead of obedience to God's way. The problem is sin. God made us to be whole, and our sin causes brokenness. Ultimately, our sin separates us from God. We have a broken relationship with God because a perfect God in his complete holiness cannot be with sin in the same way that light cannot be with darkness for light pushes out the darkness. Oil and water cannot exist in the same space. One pushes out the other. Therefore, there needed to be a solution to this problem of broken relationship with God. You know, we look at the shipwreck of God's creation, knowing that this is not what we see, is not what we were created to be. This is not what God had in mind when he said it was good. We're looking at the shipwreck, looking at these broken pieces, saying that that's the problem. But we got to be asking ourselves, what made the shipwreck? What caused it? And we have to remember, again, that this was not what God intended God created us with the ability to reciprocate love. What kind of a relationship is it if if it's mandated where God said he created us with the ability to choose him, to choose to love him, which also meant there was the ability to not choose him or his way, but to choose our own. And because of this sin, we have this world steeped in problems that all stem from putting self first. And the chief of the problems being a people without a relationship with God. Are you with me, church? This is the problem. Without relationship, we have no hope. The only hope we have is what we can make for ourselves at all costs in this world right here. And what we see, these problems we see are the costs of our selfishness. The problems that we see all around us are the costs of man's pursuit to find our own significance and hope outside of a saving relationship with Jesus. The problem of our world cannot be solved without a solution to the issue of sin. And for God, the solution was simple. We need a savior And the only way to save and redeem the world was for God to do it himself. 
This is why in Matthew chapter 1, as the angels uh, appearing to, to Joseph to confirm what had been communicated to, to Mary, he said this, Mary will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. The name of Jesus means Yahweh saves. The Lord is salvation, and it's out of the abundance of God's love for us and his creation that he sent his son born sinless in this miracle of a virgin birth, to be an atoning sacrifice for our sins, to make us right with God. Romans 6, it says this, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so, church, Jesus' birth that we celebrate and that all attention is focused to here at this season is directly connected to his death and resurrection. They are inseparably linked We celebrate Christ's birth not because he was adorable. I'm sure he was. But we celebrate his birth because he came to save. And he saved us through his blood, shed on the cross for us. They're intrinsically connected. When we celebrate one, we celebrate the other. They cannot exist without each other. He came to save. 1 John 2 2 says, He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the world. Praise the Lord that there's nothing that his blood, that his sacrifice cannot redeem worldwide. All across this globe. So you got to ask yourselves this question, do you need a savior? Do you need a savior? It's something that we personally, individually have to answer for ourselves. Because I think problem, we, we begin to feel maybe indifferent towards our need because of our circumstance. Maybe we're doing well or maybe we're self-sufficient. Things are going good. We feel that we are our own masters of our own destiny. And so, church, I I fear that, uh, I believe, really, that our lack of need in our culture, in a first world culture, keeps us from feeling the gravity of how much we truly are in need. And it's obviously we all have our own struggles. There's things that are very real. I'm not diminishing that. But I'm saying with the assets at our disposal, with with the immediate support that surrounds us in our culture, we can begin to feel invincible or self-reliant, that we don't need saving. What do we need saving from? But take away any of those support walls of relationships health, income, technology, whatever it is, things that we depend on and we can learn real quick what the rest of the world understands fourfold. Ultimately, and it's this, that ultimately we depend on something outside of ourselves to meet our needs. And what need is the greatest one that we have? And it's this, we need a restored relationship with God. And Jesus was God's solution to that problem. The purpose for why he came was simple. To deal with the issue of sin. To save us, that we can be restored in relationship to God. So what kind of a savior was Jesus? What kind of a savior? God could have came and entered into his creation at any point. He had the power to create. He had the power to come in. He, he can do whatever. But he chose to come in first century Middle East in a very difficult, a very rough time. He came to a people, his nation Israel, that he had built and created, but who had been torn apart by its own doing, by its own rejection of God, to do what they wanted to serve their own desires. So he came to a people who were under brutal Roman occupation, who maintained peace through oppression. You know, it's actually interesting, the writer Luke in his gospel, he begins Luke chapter 2 with, in those days Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. And here we are at the top of the chapter of Jesus' birth story, seeing this, this name, Caesar Augustus, who at the time in that culture was viewed as a god. Controlled the entire world and had created a season of of peace that was unparalleled at the time, but through use of force and domination. And here, juxtaposed in this passage, is Caesar Augustus issued a decree, this godlike 
person and ruler. And yet we have at the end that Jesus was born the one to save, who literally was God. We see that juxtaposition. But this is when he came. He came to a people living on a 400-year-old promise of God's deliverance. And all the while, while they waited, making up in their minds what they think their deliverance, what their Savior will be like. And if you ever do that, you're waiting for something. Maybe it's a, a, a season, a trip, a, um, you know, family time, whatever, whatever it may be. And you begin to like write in your mind what that future event is going to be like. Oh, it's going to be great. We're going to do all these things. And then inevitably you get there and you're like, this isn't what I created in my mind that it would be like. And we, we have let down and all that kind of stuff. I mean, that, this happens with us sometimes with the kids. I like to, to tell them, like, just play with them and say, hey, you know, I'm, I got a surprise for you at home. And maybe it's a treat, like a like donuts or, or, or a family's coming to visit or something, something that, that's significant but they don't know about. And I'll tell them that in the car we're driving. And, hey, guys, I got a surprise for you. And they're in the back, what is it? Tell us, tell us. They're like, no, no, I got a surprise. You have to wait. You have to wait. We want to know. We want to tell them. What is it? What is it? Is it a video game? Did you get us a video game? Did you get us a toy? Luke, I think you got a toy. And they start making up in their minds what they think it is, right? We got a puppy. We're getting a puppy, Luke. It's, Daddy, we get a puppy? I can't tell. That's a surprise. We got a puppy. It's just... They make up in their mind by the time that we get home. It's just they, they've created this whole reality. And then when you tell them, like, hey, we got donuts, they're like, I wanted a puppy. <laughs> the, the solution had to be exactly what they wanted their way. And this is what happens. The people who were waiting and longing, hoping for an answer, but they painted a picture based on what they wanted, not what they needed. They wanted a warrior to rise up to deliver them from their oppression and their immediate pain, but God knew that their problem was much deeper than Rome. The problem was in their heart, and they needed a God-wrought miracle to restore what was the true problem. Any solution to the problem of sin, to the problem of our world that doesn't deal with sin and the brokenness of our heart is an insufficient solution. So here's what God did. God revealed his plan of rescue and salvation, that he was coming to rescue his people. He revealed this to Mary and Joseph. Mary, who scholars believe was probably just a 14-year-old virgin. 14 years old. In some backwood town of Nazareth that's only mentioned once or twice in Scripture. Not even on the maps. You know, I thought I grew up in a small town in rural, rural Ohio, St. Clairsville. You know, it's, it's a small town. But then I started dating my wife, Hannah, and she said she was from a small town in Kansas. And I was like, yeah, I'm from a small town. She's like, not as small as mine. <laughs> you go about an hour and a half east or west of, of Wichita, Kansas, and you begin to see just fields and fields and fields. And you're like, where are you taking me? And you finally get there, and she's like, here's our downtown. And it's like one building. It's fascinating, but we get perspective that this was, this was not some, some grand person. This was ordinary people in just an ordinary town that was struggling to make ends meet. And so they had this, this assignment that was given that they said yes to from the, from the angel telling them what would happen. And they said yes. They believed, but while they were waiting for the baby to come, they had to go to Bethlehem because of this census. So they went to Bethlehem, and it says this in Luke chapter 2, verses 6. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. Church, Luke, the, the writer Luke, the book Luke, is considered one of the greatest historical counts of all of ancient writing. I mean, it, scholars praise his accuracy, his authority, the authorship, the beauty of the intricacy of his writing is, is unparalleled. And all he gives us is two verses on the birth of Jesus. The time came and the baby was born. She put him in the manger. You ask me about any of my kids' births, I'll give you a play-by-play -play of how I was tired and I was hungry and my feet hurt. Yes, Hannah did all the work, yes. But I was hungry. There was a Star Wars marathon on on the TV, so that helped. But there's all these details, right, that we have. And, and we're kind of left 
Luke leaves us to fill in the gaps of, of what happened. But if any of you have been around in the room of a birth, you know what happened. It's a little timeless. But yet what happens now, what we're used to in a sterile, uh, individual, personal hospital room, or maybe in the comfort of your home with, with trained professionals at our disposal, happened for Mary in a cold, dirty barnyard, far from home, far from family. There was nothing simple about this. So what was our Savior like? He's the one who doesn't need a palace or anything to give him authority or status. He's the one who was born homeless and poor. He was the one who didn't come to be served, but to serve. That is our Savior. That's our God. He came in the lowest possible circumstance to show us that his solution to the simple problem of sin in our world is for simple people to receive. He came so that we, everybody, could identify with him. He was not above us. He came in the lowest possible circumstance that all could identify with him as their Savior. The lowest of the low, he came. And this good news of Jesus is for simple, not for the sophisticated. It's for all to receive. It says here in Luke chapter 2, it goes on, verse 8. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. The greatest announcement ever in the history of our world. The greatest announcement that God had a solution to literally every problem of a seeking, hurting soul. And it was first told to a people who were least respected outcasts, the shepherds. The only people group lower in society than the shepherds were the lepers. The shepherds could not be even used as a, a, vi a viable real witness in the court of law because they were seen as so untrustworthy. They were ceremonially unclean simply because of their work. Outcasts couldn't be helped. And yet this is who God gives the message to. You see, God puts his cookies on the bottom shelf that all could come and receive to communicate that he can reveal himself to anybody. You put the cookies on the bottom shelf in my house. They gone. In a very short amount of time. Because all would come and receive them at their own liking, usually right before dinner. But God puts his cookies on the bottom shelf that all would receive to communicate that all could come and he would reveal himself to anyone. See, this is a core fundamental uh, belief as a church, as a French church with our Quaker history. It was this belief that the living and eternal Christ is able to speak to the condition of every humble and seeking soul. That's what we believe. That's what we base our movement around, that each one of us is able to receive from the Lord. And we can walk in that obedience with him. The simple message of Jesus is for all people. Somebody say all people. All people. That's you and me. He could have just revealed himself to kings. He could have revealed himself to the elite. That he would have a position then in, in, in government and authority. No. But he didn't choose to do this. He went to the least to say that you are worthy to receive this good news that I have come to save. You are worthy. It's not just, again, not just the station of the shepherds in society that was important, but we need to look at something even more significant or just as significant about shepherds. You see, God always used shepherds throughout the Bible to do his work. Time and time again, uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in some way were connected to shepherding, the patriarchs of our faith. Even Moses and David, men that God raised up to deliver his people, came from the fields, shepherding. And Jesus even himself identifies in John chapter 10. He says, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. 
and I laid down my life for the sheep. You see, Jesus is both shepherd and sacrifice. He is both shepherd and sacrificial lamb. It's interesting, you know, this is just a hypothesis, but it's kind of interesting to me that scholars believe that these sheep, that these shepherds were watching outside of Bethlehem were destined for sacrifice in the temple. Purely based on just proximity with Bethlehem being so close to Jerusalem and that they were within reach of running and going to see the, the city of Bethlehem, that these were special Sheep being raised for sacrifice. And, and just how fitting, even just to consider, you know, whether that's true or not, the idea that the idea that God is saying to them, I see what you're doing. I see the, the, the work that you're doing to raise up these sheep as an offering, a sacrifice to me. Let me show you what I'm doing. Let me show you what I'm doing. I'm raising up a sacrifice that will be for all people for all time. What an amazing gift, a validation to say, I see you. God sees you and reveals himself to you. Whatever status you feel like you are, rich, poor, young, old, it doesn't matter. The message of the gospel is for, the good news that Christ has come is for all people. The angel didn't just announce the birth, but they invited the shepherds to go and see for themselves. It goes on in, in, in Luke 2, verses 12 through 20. It says, This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let us go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. And when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what they had been told about this child. And all who had heard it were amazed at what the shepherds had said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds then returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. So three things here about the shepherds I want us to unpack today. I want us to, to take in, to remember. It's these three things. One, they believed the message of the angels and went and found the baby. They believed and they went. True belief always results in an obedient response. Hear that again. True belief always results in obedient response. When we believe the good news of Jesus, there will be changes. Do you hear that? When we believe there will be changes, it wasn't enough for them to hear this mighty heavens open and the chorus of angels sing, glory to God in the highest, today a child has been born. It wasn't enough for them to hear, but they had to go and see. The revelation of God's plan resulted in obedient action because they believed. Second thing, when they had seen him, they spread the word. They spread the word. A group of people who their entire life have been told, your voice doesn't matter, went and told. They had every reason not to share. Why would they? No one would believe them. But yet they went and told, and it said that people were amazed. All who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds had said to them. They had every reason I think we can usually think of a lot of reasons of why we do not share the message of God's love to the people in the world around. That's not cool. Don't do that. There's, there's pressure, maybe even relationally in your family. If I do this, it will make Thanksgiving and Christmas weird. We, have, we can think of reasons why we won't share this message but yet God used the lowest people to share the greatest news. So therefore, we have no excuse why we're too good or not good enough to share the message of the gospel. God placed it in the hands of people who were viewed as untrustworthy, and they just went like wildfire and said, I don't care what the status is. I don't care the judgment. I'm going to tell what I heard and what I have seen. 
Third thing, it says they went back glorifying God to their same situations. It doesn't say that they signed a book deal about angels in the sky. By It doesn't say that they went on tour telling people. It says they went back. They returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen. They went back to their situations. Like these shepherds, the ordinary people like you and me, that God calls to see the Savior, because we're all called to the manger, to see him, to know him as Lord. The ordinary people that God calls are always sent back to shepherd, to steward the responsibilities God has given them, but to do it for God's glory. Just like we see that in the New Testament with, with Jesus restoring Peter after Peter had denied him when he was on trial. After Jesus' resurrection, he appeared to Peter and he said, Peter, do you love me? Peter said, you, you know I love you. He said, then feed my sheep. I don't think that's a coincidence. Feed my sheep. Tend to the responsibility that I have given you to glorify God in the midst of that responsibility. Church, you and I, we are called to be a people of simplicity. To simply hear, to simply go and see. It says you will find the baby. They had to go. He makes it easy to find. But there's a part on our responsibility to go. We need to be a people of simplicity to hear, to go to tell others, and then to return into our places that God has us to share this good news, to give glory to him, to not have divided hearts, to be running, okay, this is my, my, my lifetime, and this, this, this is my Jesus time, and it's divided. I'm only a Christian, a Christ follower in this area, but not that area. No, God calls us to be consumed by him because he is the solution to our problem to our brokenness. We are in need of a savior. And certainly our speech, our lifestyle will reveal the condition of our heart. So are we living as people who have received this news that a savior has been born? Are we a people who have seen him and spent time with him? Are we a people who go and tell? Are we a people who are sent back into our situations glorifying God? That's what it means to simply trust and obey, to follow after this God who came to save. You know, God's purpose for Jesus was to be the simple solution to the problem of sin in our world. He came to the simplest of people so that whosoever would believe in him would have the hope of eternal life, this restored relationship. So I encourage you, as we, as we live now in the in-between, not just between Thanksgiving and Christmas, but this in-between Christ's life, his birth, life, death, resurrection, and then now his return, as we wait in between. I encourage you, we have to be a people who, who choose to be people who simply say yes to that assignment. We say yes to Jesus as a solution for the hurt in you and the hurt in our world. So what can we do? We can humble ourselves. We can humble ourselves. We're not too good. We're not too low. To be recep re recipients of this good news. We have to humble ourselves. Make room in our schedule to receive from the Lord. We have to go and see. We have to spend time with Jesus. We need to tell others to, to think consciously in our day, Lord, would you put someone in my path that I could obediently share the message of God to them? And then we have to be giving God the glory in the midst of our circumstance, living in such a way that others look at that and say, hey, they're different. Why are they different? Because look what God's done in me. I'm living not for my own status, not to build a hope that's based on what I can make. I'm living for the glory of God because of what he's done for me. You see, church, we cannot just run to Bethlehem at the season of Christmas and, and look into the manger and ooh and ah at the baby. Oh, how sweet, baby Jesus. If Jesus is not born in your heart, Jesus could be born a thousand times in Bethlehem and it makes no difference in you. We cannot just receive the news and stay. 
We have to receive and go in obedience the way that God would call us to this season. Let's cultivate meaningful moments of remembrance. What do we need to lay down to make space in our lives to remember that truth that you need a Savior? And our Savior is Christ the Lord. We would receive him. Would you stand as we pray? Father God, we thank you and praise you for this moment that we can share together. Thank you for this good news that you have spread, that you've opened up the heavens to announce that you have saved the world through Jesus Christ, your son. Lord, I I pray right now for those in the room who maybe have never received you, who've never said you are Lord, you are my savior. Lord, I, I thank you for your invitation. I pray that they would make this prayer their own of, Lord, I love you, I believe in you. I'm I'm sorry for the brokenness that I've caused in my life. Lord, would you forgive me for what I've done? I believe you are my savior. I accept your forgiveness. Help me to live in obedience to you. Father, we, we thank you that you, you, you have given us this hope that, that those who've made that their confession, who've received you, we have hope with you. Would you remind us of that hope in this season? Well, we are surrounded by problems, Lord. We don't diminish that idea that there are struggles and tragedy and trauma all around us. Lord, help us to see beyond that, to see that you are our solution because in you there is hope beyond our circumstances hope for time with you, relationship with you. Remind us of that. Restore unto us the joy of salvation in you this season. Lord, lead us in the ways that we should go, that we would follow you, going and telling and glorifying you in our situations. We ask this in your holy name. Amen. Let's worship together.
notes here. Um, great message, Seth. Thank you for bringing that. And really got to think about this. I don't need deliverance from Rome. I need deliverance from brokenness. No one can get me out of the situation that I was in except for Jesus. Nothing can. That's why I need him. So there's two people here in the room today. Those who have put their faith in Jesus and for you, I would say, remember to be thankful that he got you out of your broken situation. And he put you on new ground, gave you new clothes, and restored your life. Then there are those of you who haven't put your faith in Jesus. And I'd like to say to you, why not today? He offers it to us. And anybody can get to it. It's down low enough for us to reach so any of us can get to it. And I want to encourage you, maybe today's the day. Come talk to me, come talk to Seth. We'd love to talk to you about that. If you'd like a more discreet way of doing it, you can do it on your the guest card here. You can check the box here. But this is a, maybe this is a Sunday where you do that. I want to encourage you, whatever the Holy Spirit's telling you to do, to do that thing, to do that thing today. Well, the holiday season has already kicked off around here at least. We've got a lot of things happening in the month of December. Out in our lobby in our cafe, there's some QR codes you can scan to see what's going on. Every single weekend, we have something going on here from cookie decorations to hot chocolate bar. Um, I almost said hot chocolate decoration and cookie bar. Either way, it's sweet. So, and then we have Christmas Fest, which is a big family thing we do. So I encourage you to go check that out. Again, if you need prayer, you can go to our prayer wall. Let me pray over you before we're dismissed, and I just pray that God would do a mighty thing in your life today. God, I pray your might, your strength, your power would show up in someone's life today, show up in my life today. As a result of what we've done here, God, you've opened our eyes to something. We're now responsible for what we have heard, and we're responsible now to do something with what we've heard. So lead us and guide us into our next step. I thank you so much for this season, the reminder that, you're, that you came and that you're still here among us. I'm glad that you're with us today, God. I hope that what you've heard and seen in our hearts please you. And I pray these things in your name. Amen. Have a great Sunday.